right. It is right at three o'clock. And so we are going to get started with today's webinar. I'm going to go over a little housekeeping as people trickle in. If you have any questions or tech issues, please send us a message in the chat. If you have questions about the webinar, please send those in the q and I will give you a little spiel about that in a moment. But without further ado, let's get started. So thank you so much for joining today's webinar hosted by the Lindfest Ocean Program. My name is Vicki Bell. I'm a senior digital associate at Lindfest and I will be your host for the session. Today I am joined by senior officer Sarah Close who will walk you through some details of the RFP process and manager Emily Knight who will be in the chat and dropping links to important information as we go along. So in terms of virtual housekeeping, before we dive into the content, we have a couple of things to cover. This webinar is being recorded and the recording will be available on our YouTube channel for those who couldn't make it or those who may wanna watch again. Do not forget to subscribe to our newsletter and follow us on social media to stay up to date on our latest projects and events and to hear updates from these projects. There will be a Q&A at the end of all of the presentations. If you have questions, please use the Q&A box and we will address them at the end. Because we do have four projects presenting in one webinar, if your question is specific to one team, please let us know. All participants are muted during the presentation. Please keep everything to the Q&A or the chat box. For the presenters, I will be coming on camera when you are at the two minute mark. Each team will have 10 minutes to present. So if you see me, just know that you have a couple of minutes left and then we have to move on to the next set of people. The purpose of today's webinar is to provide insights into some of our new projects and how the research team plans to engage with managers and stakeholders throughout their development. Our aim is to foster a dialogue around these projects and bridge the gap between theory and application and fisheries management. This is the first of a two part series. The second will take place at 9 a.m. Eastern time next Thursday. If you are interested in joining us for that, Emily will drop a registration link in the chat that will have the three additional projects we are also funding, but due to time zones and the length of the webinar, we did have to split them into two. So I'm going to take a moment and introduce the Linfest Ocean Program. We are a grant making program that is housed within the Pew Charitable Trusts in Washington, DC. We take a very unique approach to funding and we fund research by actively involving users from the onset and throughout all the grant cycle to ensure practical outcomes. Our mission is to fund scientific research that is informative, useful, and directly applicable to decision making and management processes. We prioritize collaboration with users from the project's inception to ensure research products are valuable and timely. In terms of the RFP process, traditionally we develop research projects one at a time, but for this initiative, we took a little bit of a different approach. Sarah will talk to you in a second in more detail, but in the fall of last year, we initiated our first request for proposals seeking innovative projects to address the complex challenges of managing marine areas in a changing ocean. So as I said, Sarah will talk to you a little bit about that process in a minute, but we were very excited by all the applications we got and this webinar is to go through those that we chose to fund. Today's webinar will cover four projects. We have a total of seven research grants, three more you can hear about next week and two planning grants, which Sarah will go over in a little bit. Our four projects today are collaborative research to identify climate refugia and support resilience in MPAs in Baja, California, fostering climate resilient biodiversity and fisheries in Eastern tropical Pacific MPAs, tools to assess in response to climate impacts on Bonaire National Marine Park, and blending indigenous and Western science to improve climate ready management of MPAs in the US. These projects showcase the innovative research we're supporting and we're really excited to delve deeper into them shortly. I do wanna mention that aside from these projects today, we do have three more next week. So the webinar, as I said, will be Thursday, September 14th at 9 a.m. If you want to join us, 
the link will be in the chat. Or if you just want to get the recording, because 9 a.m. might not be the best time for you to come to a webinar, depending on what time zone you're in, it's 9 a.m. Eastern. If you sign up, I will send the recording directly to your inbox. So now that we've covered housekeeping and introduced ourselves, I will pass it over to Sarah to provide more details about the RFP process and dive deeper into some specifics. Take it away. Great, well, thanks Vicki. Um, and thanks everyone for being here. We're really excited to have the chance to um, have you all hear about these projects that we are funding. So like Vicki said, I'm gonna provide a little bit of context about these projects. Um, in some of the planning grants that we funded that you won't hear about on this series, but I will try to keep it quick because I know you all are here to hear about the research projects and not hear from us. Um, so as Vicki said, these projects came out of scoping efforts that really began in 2020 and 2021. Um, and after doing sort of individual scoping on this topic of marine protected areas and climate change for a long time, um, some of you may remember that about this time last year, we held two virtual scoping sessions that brought people together from around the world who work on various aspects of this challenge of how can we manage marine protected areas in ways that account for and adapt to the impacts of climate change. Um, and throughout our scoping, we really heard a lot of interest in the topic, uh, which did not surprise us, a wide variety of research needs and a number of questions from MPA managers, especially who were increasingly faced with um, questions about what they should be doing on the ground in their protected areas to adapt, prepare for the impacts of climate change or to better understand some of the changes they may see and how to actually um, understand what's going on in their MPA and adapt to that. So through our initial scoping, and these virtual sessions, we really zeroed in on that question that you see here on the slide of how can we manage marine protected areas in ways that account for and adapt to the impacts of climate change. Those sessions, oh, next slide, Vicki. Um, enabled us to uh, take the input that we had garnered from many people around the world in various, working on various aspects of this challenge um, to craft the RFP in a way that we hoped would resonate with people and be really useful on the ground to people. So the focus of the request for proposals was on management of existing MPAs. And we identified four topical priorities that projects should, I, should address through their work on the ground. Um, those were monitoring ecosystem changes to inform management response, incorporating climate considerations into protected area management, addressing or looking at the social ecological impacts of climate change and their intersection with MPA management, and thinking about the enabling conditions for MPA governance and adaptation under climate change. Um, every proposal did not have to address every one of these things, but you'll see these themes come up throughout this webinar and the one next week as major areas that people decided to focus on. And then finally, and, and really importantly for the Lundfest Ocean Program, we ask that all proposals incorporate substantial efforts at partnering and engaging with research users on the ground in the MPAs that they're planning to work in throughout their project. Um, and you'll really see that reflected in the talks today as well as next week as our teams talk through their research projects. And we have a number of the project partners on the webinar today as well. Next slide, please, Vicki. So as we mentioned, we also had an opportunity for people to apply for planning grants. And I wanted to highlight the two that we've funded um, for you up front because they won't be presenting on any of the webinars now, but we do hope to share their research and outputs um, as they move forward as well. Um, so planning grants were meant to be shorter efforts. Um, they're one-year projects and um, really to fill a need for convening, planning, or a relationship building that is often cited as a gap in research funding. So this webinar series highlights the research project teams, um, but the two planning grants that were successful are listed here, and Emily just shared a link to the website that has more information about them as well. Um, the first is led by Katie Lohr and Jillian Neuberger at the National Marine Sanctuaries Foundation. And this is focused on climate informed ecosystem restoration with a specific focus on restoration in coral and kelp ecosystems across the National Marine Sanctuary System. 
The second project is led by Sarah Hutto, uh, along with a team of collaborators at the Greater Fairlands Association. It is focused on bringing people together across the west coast of North America and Central America to collaborate around how protected areas can work together to protect whales, which are increasingly some of the most vulnerable species in their focal protected areas, especially the Greater Farallons and Portal Bank National Marine Sanctuaries. Um, and, and both of these have a number of activities throughout the year, um, but are, are very focused on bringing people together and developing a better understanding in collaboration with many different partners. So we're excited to be supporting these planning grants and um, we will likely be sharing information about these efforts as they move forward in the future. So stay, stay tuned for more information about those projects as well in the future. And with that, I'll give it back to Vicki. Awesome. So without further ado, let's get into it. I'm going to let each of the research teams introduce themselves as some of the teams are fairly large and some team members could be here and some couldn't. The presentations will only have a couple of speakers, but I, we wanted to start by acknowledging the team members who are present as well. As a reminder, the Q&A will be at the end of the presentation. If you have questions you want to send as we go, feel free to do that in the Q&A panel, but they will be answered at the end. Because we have four research teams, we do ask that you put which project you're talking about before your question, if you have a specific team in mind. If you have questions for the Linfest Ocean Program, feel free to email us at info at linfestocean.org. We really want to keep the focus of this webinar on the projects. We're happy to answer questions offline. That info at is monitored. I check it every day. We definitely will get back to you. So we're going to start off and I will hand it over to the first team, which is tools to assess and respond to climate impacts on Bonaire National Marine Park. And as you guys go, just say next slide and I can pop it over. Great, thank you, Vicki. Hi, I'm Sarah Lester. I'm a professor at Florida State University. And as Vicki mentioned, um, our project is looking at tools to assess and respond to climate impacts within uh, the Bonaire National Marine Park. Next slide. Um, so this project is a collaboration between researchers at Florida State University and Stanapa National Parks Foundation in Bonaire. Um, within the Department of Biological Science at Florida State University, uh, Andrew Rassweiler and myself run a joint lab, the Raster Lab, that focuses on understanding the ecology and spatial dynamics of marine ecosystems in order to better advance conservation, management, and restoration. Um, and in addition to Andrew and myself on our project team, um, also my PhD student, Laura, Laurel Field, um, is leading many components of the project, and this is going to be um, an important part of her dissertation. Karen? Hi, I'm Karen Eckridge, and I'm working together with Roxanne Leanna Franziska as ecology advisors on this project. Uh, we both work for Stinafa, and Stinafa is a non-governmental, non-profit foundation, and we're mandated by the local government to manage the Bonaire National Marine Park. And right now we're in the process of hiring an additional staff member with the funding from this grant. Uh, we call this person the Climate Resilience Project Manager, who will add capacity to STINAPA to do this important work. Next slide. Park. You see the next slide. It's in light blue. It surrounds the entire island and also the islet of Klein Bonaire it was established in 1979. It protects coastal and nearshore marine ecosystems, including coral reefs, seagrass beds, mangrove forests uh, around the entire island. We're a Dutch island in the Caribbean leeward Antilles. We're managed by Stinapa. It includes developing and updating a management plan for the park. We do scientific monitoring and research. We do law enforcement, public outreach, we do education, and we advise our local government as well. We have some of the healthiest coral reefs in the Caribbean, and diving and other marine-based activities support a very economically important tourism industry for the islands. 
Like all tropical islands, the area is facing major climate impacts and building climate resilience is a major priority for us as well as uh, the marine park and our island. We have the capacity at Kinapa to make adjustments to the monitoring and the management of the marine park, but we need guidance. We need tools and capacity to effectively detect and respond to climate threats. Yeah, and so the, the goals of this project are to address this need that, that Karen just articulated for improved climate resilience and adaptive capacity for the Bonaire National Marine Park by first assessing climate vulnerability, second, improving monitoring and early detection of climate impacts, and third, by planning dynamic management responses and informing new uh, zoning regulations. Next slide. And so the main activities of this project have been designed in order to be able to directly inform management for the Bonaire National Marine Park, but also hopefully more broadly, particularly for islands across the Dutch Caribbean. So our plans are first to map cumulative human impacts to the marine environment, accounting for key habitats um, and human activities and stressors, and then combine that with a map of estimated climate vulnerability. And these estimates will primarily be generated from remote sensing and in situ historical climate trends, but we're also going to evaluate downscaled climate models um, to see if they'll be useful, although there's some concern about um, model resolution model resolution. And these cumulative impact and climate vulnerability maps will be important inputs to other components of the work, but they're also going to be directly useful for Stanapa's management and outreach work. Uh, second, we're going to conduct a systematic review of Stanapa's MPA monitoring programs within the context of climate change detection and response. So um, aligning this review with the vulnerability maps I just described will allow us to identify key monitoring gaps both across space and in terms of uh, frequency of taking these measurements. So we'll make suggestions about how monitoring effort could potentially be reallocated to help improve early detection of climate change impacts. And then we also plan to create an online dashboard to streamline analysis and visualization of Stanapa's monitoring data and to integrate these data with other data streams um, as a way to sort of help make, uh, enable SNAPA to be able to make rapid management decisions in response to incoming data. And then third, building on these uh, first two activities, we're gonna develop recommendations for SNAPA for implementing adaptive dynamic management responses to climate events in the marine park. So examples could include temporary dive closures to reduce stressors, or increase monitoring effort or collecting particular types of data during climate change events. And then we'll also use the cumulative impact and climate vulnerability mapping to make recommendations for future rezonation of the park, which is a longer term management priority for Stinapa. Um, and we'll do this by conducting a prioritization analysis that accounts for climate resilience, human uses, and key habitats. So for example, areas that have low climate vulnerability but really high ecological importance could be priority areas for zonation to help reduce overall stressors to the marine environment. So the output to this research, just described by Sarah, will be a key focus of our outreach as we wanna make sure to share what we've learned with other MPA management uh, authorities. So we'll start with the Dutch Caribbean islands, but eventually we wanna reach out to the broader MPA community with our findings. We'll incorporate climate change vulnerability information into our existing public outreach programs. So we have a connecting people with nature lecture series. We have bubbles from the biologists, uh, newspaper columns, but also social media, of course. So we'll hopefully increase public understanding of how to protect marine ecosystems um, and how the protection of such will improve climate resilience. We'll host a listening session with the public and several workshops with stakeholder groups to understand local priorities and to keep the local community informed. So these events will also directly inform the development of rezonation recommendations. So we want to host a webinar and a workshop at the end of the project to share our approach and findings with the MPA management community. Also, even though the local and national governments are currently implementing nature conservation projects, that indirectly address climate change resilience, there's really no clear plan or policy that directly addresses it. So 
a government and stakeholder panel is currently being formed to do so, and we hope to be part of that. Thank you. And awesome. that's the end of our presentation. <laughs> You're good. Um, I'm switching back and forth between three screens, so sorry if things are a little delayed. But yeah, I will go ahead and pass it over to the next team, Fostering Climate Resilient Biodiversities and Fisheries in Eastern Tropical Pacific MPAs. Take it away. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for being here. Um, I'm Juliana Palacios. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of British Columbia, and as I said, our, our project is called Fostering Climate Change by Diversity and Fishers in Eastern Tropical Pacific uh, Marine Protected Areas. I'll start, um, next, uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, I'll start by presenting our team. Uh, our team is uh, basically from two institutions, um, from the University of British Columbia, uh, William Chung and myself. And then from uh, Marviva, which is an NGO based uh, in Costa Rica, are Cristina Sanchez, Catherine Arroyo, Raquel Romero, Melissa Alvarez, and Teresa Villalobos. And Taylor Clark is uh, both associated to the University of British Columbia and Marviva. And today, me and Taylor will be uh, talking, talking to you about our project, but um, the rest of the team will be online in case you have any questions. Um, I'd be happy to add. Uh, next slide, please. Right, so um, our project is located in the Eastern Tropical Pacific. As this, so as you can see in the map on the right, um, mostly located in the exclusive economic zones of Costa Rica, Panama, Colombia, and Ecuador, including uh, the Galapagos. Islands. Um, this area is a biodiversity hotspot where uh, fish are quite important not only for fisheries but also for uh, tourism. This area, as many other parts of the ocean, it has major threats from ocean warming and specifically expansion of oxygen minimum zones, as well as uh, illegal fishing. Uh, occurring in the region and around the protected areas. The our project is specifically focused in the Eastern Tropical Pacific Marine Corridor, known as CEMAR. And this is a regional initiative between the four countries mentioned, Costa Rica, Panama, Colombia, and Ecuador, um, to have a network of marine, this network of marine protected areas that include Galapagos uh, in Ecuador, um, Cocos Island in Costa Rica, Coiba in Panama, and Malpelo. So these uh, four MPAs have been recently expanded uh, in the region. And there is a need from the CEMAR to, and for the regional management, it, uh, sorry, for the local management agencies to understand how climate change is going to affect these regions and these MPAs in order to uh, improve MPA resilience and um, to the effects of ocean, specifically to ocean warming and the expansion of oxygen in the zones. Next uh, slide, please. So with that in mind, the objectives of our project uh, is to provide to uh, the management agency and to CEMAR, key information uh, required to develop the climate resilient management measures. Uh, these include um, ocean warming and exogenation uh, projections uh, for the region. Um, also, these will be coupled with, um, with ecosystem models to understand shifts in biogeography, in biogeography, habitat compression, and the implications for fisheries and tourism, um, create climate resilience of the transboundary marine protected network, as well as hopefully uh, provide recommendations for uh, produce climate smart management. Uh, next. Right, so I'll now pass to my colleague, Taylor, who will take it uh, from here. 
Thank you very much, Juliano. And let's cross fingers. I just lost electricity. So let's hope that uh, I have electricity for the remainder of the presentation. So we plan to accomplish the goals that we set out for ourselves within this project through four different components. We are going to begin with computer modeling to begin to understand how climate change might be affecting the ocean conditions within the Eastern Tropical Pacific and then how that can affect key species for fisheries, conservation, and tourism activities. This will include a three-dimensional approach so that we can understand how the expansion of the oxygen minimum zones could compress the habitat of large pelagic species like tuna and their prey, and then how this might affect uh, fishing effort distributions and catches. We're also going to be carrying out a two-dimensional modeling approach so that we can understand how climate change would affect the distribution of fisheries catches and how different configurations and ways of managing the marine protected areas may, may change the potential catches under climate change and confer resilience or not to these fisheries. Then Maravilla, which is a regional NGO and a partner of the management body of the CIMAR, which is the, the marine uh, protected area network, the, the marine corridor within the Eastern Tropical Pacific, they're going to be developing a stakeholder engagement process. There, they are going to be finding out what the desirable futures are for key stakeholders and what would be acceptable management measures that we could take to reach these desirable futures under climate change. The results of both the computer modeling and the stakeholder en engagement processes will be communi communicated to a wide diversity of, of audiences through our outreach component, through different uh, communication products like policy briefs, uh, scientific publications, podcasts even. And then we're going to be synthesizing this information to be able to uh, support decision-making. Next slide, please. So Marviva is going to be synthesizing and taking all of this information to the people in charge of making decisions within the marine corridor, within the CMAR. And they're going to be providing information to address uh, decision-making in five key areas that have been identified as priorities, like addressing the climate impacts on fishery resources, controlling IU fishing, uh, developing a regional transboundary fisheries management framework, managing no-take zones inside NPAs, and then all of these components will contribute to climate change adaptation for fishing and tourism activities within the CIMA. The Marviva is going to be using different tools to inform management. They're going to be using participatory workshops. They're going to meet with decision makers, create different outreach materials in Spanish and in English and research publications and policy briefs are also uh, going to be a tool that they're that they will be using next slide please we expect that our project will leave several products that will live beyond the life of this project project so for example we're going to create a database with information on biodiversity and environmental data that CIMA can use the, the CIMAR, the Marine Corridor, can use to inform management after this project has ended. Uh, we also hope that the information and engagement with decision makers will improve climate adaptation of management plans within the Marine Protected Area Network. And then just a general increase in awareness of how climate change might affect uh, the Eastern Tropical Pacific and what we can do to adapt to these changes. Next slide, please. We would like to thank the Landfest Ocean Program for supporting our project. And we would like to thank Fundación Marviva and the University of British Columbia for co-leading the project. Thank you very much.
Thank you. We're going to keep moving along and the next project is collaborative research to identify climate refugia and support resilience in MPAs in Baja, California. Floor is yours. Thank you, Vicky. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. And thanks, uh, Lenfes Ocean Program, for trusting us on this very important work. Today, I'm going to be the presenter. I'm honored to represent my group, where we're going to talk a little bit about our project that is very collaborative and is aimed to identify climate refugia for kelp forests in Mexico and how can we support resilience in MPS in Baja California. Next, please. So our team is composed of a group of researchers, academics, NGO, and, and fishers. Fiorenza Micheli is the lead PI of this project. Uh, she's a professor at Hopkins Marine Station, has over 20 years of experience working in Mexico, supporting communities in different conservation measures, and also in training and in other parts of the world. She's not here with us today. She's in the field working in one of our partners in Isla Natividad. Myself, who is a postdoc working with FIO at Hopkins Marine Station. I have a few years now of experience working with climate adaptation, kelp forest, and marine spatial planning. Cal Cavano, who is a professor at UCLA and has been mapping kelp forest using remote sensing for the past 15 years, including in Mexico. Ines Lopez, who is the catalyst of change in Comunidad en Biodiversidad an NGO in Mexico that has been working for over 20 years with local communities to support sustainability, equity, and engagement. Professor Gabriela Montaño from Universidad Autónoma de Baja California, who's also been working for over 20 years now in kelp forest and conservation in Mexico. And finally, Mario Ramade, who is the lead scientist in FEDECOP, which is a federation of fishing cooperatives in Mexico, Baja California, that co-manage uh, in these 10 fishing cooperatives, uh, the resources inside their fishing grounds. Next, please. So I just wanna stress the, the, that our work comes from a direct community need. Uh, last year, we had a workshop with our partners and they asked uh, how could we identify climate refugia for kelp forests and how should we be managing these places inside marine protected areas? This is just an example of some of the photos that we've been taking for throughout these years with all of the work that we do. We work closely with our partners in field work. We also have community divers that are trained in monitoring programs, a lot of this work. And finally, we've been supporting the establishment of community-based marine reserves in the last 15 years. And today there's been seven of these established. And this is a photo in the right of the last one that we've been supporting uh, this February 2023, we had a workshop to support the community to establish a community reserve in Bahia Asuncion. Next, please. So, to give a bit of context of where we work, we work in this area that is dominated by giant kelp forest. I'll talk a little bit more about this ecosystem. This region goes from the border with the US and Mexico all the way to Bahia Asuncion in Baja California. This area, there are two large marine protected areas, the Vizcaino MPA that was established in 1988 that uh, protects most of the kelp forests in the Fedecop region. And then we have six islands that are part of the Pacific Island MPA that were established in 2016. Both of these MPAs protect around 42% of kelp forests in Mexico. However, these areas are not, uh, there, there are no risk, there are, fishing, recreational and artisanal fishing is allowed. But we have, as we were mentioning, a few community-based marine reserves led by the local communities that do have more restrictions. So that's kind of the conservation context of the region. On the other hand, as you all probably are aware, giant kelp forest is one of the most productive ecosystems in the world. It provides an important habitat for biodiversity and it sustains a lot of the fisheries in this region. And next, please. <laughs> And why is this work important? Well, climate change is really impacting these ecosystems and the livelihoods of the communities. As you probably are aware, there were very strong marine heat waves between 2014, 16, that really impacted the kelp forest in Mexico. And today, eight years later, 50% of this kelp forest haven't recovered, they're lost, and that has important implications for biodiversity and the local livelihoods. Next, please. However, the impacts are not the same in all of the regions. 
and that is very important. In the south, in the distribution limit, we have a range contraction of 100 kilometers of giant kelp, and now they're being uh, displaced by a smaller species of kelp, Eclonia arborea, which is still productive, but not as much. Next, please. However, we go just a little bit farther north in some of the best or the, the areas that are, have more management, community reserves, and are isolated. And we have these thriving ecosystems, some of the most resilient in the entire uh, area where giant kelp is dominating in North America. Next, please. And finally, as we move farther north, close to the US-Mexico border, where most of the population in Baja California live, we have areas that were used to be kelp forests, now they're dominated by sea urchin barrens, very unproductive ecosystems, and it really is impacting the local economies. Next, please. All of these photos that I showed were taken this year inside MPAs, inside both of these MPAs, the large MPAs that I've been talking about. So there's a very important need to inform management of how can we adapt to all of these changes inside these MPAs. And to do that, we will do a couple of things. Some research uh, combining two different uh, data sets that we have. One is using remote sensing of kelp forests. So we have this amazing 40 year uh, time series of kelp maps that allow us to understand what has happened through time. And we also have monitoring programs for the past 15 years that allow us to combine these two data sets and answer questions like, are these areas that we're identifying as highly persistent, but they're always there despite of all of these changes, really providing refugee, climatic refugee for, this, for giant kelp and for the associate biodiversity? And are these places important for biodiversity? How should we be managing them? And we will do that also uh, throughout a series of workshops. We have three workshops planned throughout the project to co-develop this research with our partners, the FEDECOP and the other fishing communities, as well as all of the PIs that are involved in this project, plus invite invitation to some of the important stakeholders from the government. We, our aim is to end up having a guide, the climate adaptation strategy guide of how we can manage this kelp forest in these changing times. But importantly, this is a very important moment in Mexico because there's a push for community-based marine reserves right now. And our project is, is set in a great moment to inform decisions on establishing those places while considering climate adaptation, but also building a network of, of stakeholders, including fishing communities, and a hub of knowledge on how we can move forward and manage these places. Next, please. We also planned an expedition but, uh, to fill some of the gaps on the, on the water data sets that we have. We left three weeks ago from La Paz, but unfortunately we were chased by Hurricane Hillary. You probably all saw the news. So we had to cancel and run away or sail away to the north, to Ensenada, to a safe port. And we did that for five days. So finally, we were able to get back after the hurricane passed and finish our sites in the north. Just wanna stress out that this was an amazing team of divers that I was happy to lead very positive people, very happy. And we had also two community divers, two women community divers that supported us. And hopefully now we can finish the rest of our sites uh, after this. Next, please, and the final slide. Just to wrap up, we're very thankful and honored for this opportunity, for the support from the Lemphis Ocean Program, from every you, everyone that is here, and for all of the partners that are supporting us. We'll be very happy to let you know how everything is going as we move forward. And thanks everyone. Awesome, thank you so much. And we will move on to our final group before we get into the Q&A, which is blending indigenous and Western science to improve climate ready management of MPAs in the US. All yours. Thanks, Vicki. Um, hi everybody, I'm Jake Kreitzer. I'm with the Northeastern Regional Association of Coastal Ocean Observing Systems, or NIRACUS. Um, we play a convening and coordinating role related to ocean science in the Northeastern US, and that's the role we're playing in this project, which as our title might imply, um, aims to blend indigenous and Western science to improve climate-ready management of MPAs in the US. Um, next slide. 
So we have a large team um, and that um, combines on the top row representatives from two uh, indigenous communities here in the Northeast. Um, and then next to myself in the bottom row, uh, representatives from four MPAs um, also here in the Northeastern US. Um, our project um, aims to really center indigenous voices in MPA science and management. I'm gonna to attempt to model that today by leaving most of our time um, for two of my collaborators, David Whedon with the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe and Paul Puglio with the Kawasak Band of the Penacook Abenaki people, leave most of our time for them to provide their perspectives on why they're interested in this project and what they hope to achieve. I'm just gonna give, uh, try to set the stage for them um, and then provide a brief wrap up. Um, so next slide, please. So this is the context of our project. I think the starting premise is that um, probably more often than not, uh, maybe far more often than not, um, MPA management typically relies on the tools and techniques of Western science. Um, but that indigenous science, which I think is more or less synonymous with uh, indigenous traditional ecological knowledge is a valuable but underutilized um, kind of perspective. Um, and, and I think the value that indigenous science can bring to MPA management is that um, it adopts a very long-term focus on preserving cultural and natural elements for generations to come. So when we're talking about climate scale issues and climate scale change, that generational perspective is really important. Um, alongside that interconnectedness and, and that view that people are an integral part of the ecosystem, um, indigenous science um, adopts a landscape or seascape scale perspective. And again, understanding climate related um, issues and impacts often is going to mean looking beyond the borders of a particular MPA. Um, I think an important aspect of indigenous science is that it ties very strongly into subsistence and medicinal um, needs of the of the relevant communities and draws upon a variety of cultural practices and oral history. Um, and, and that connection means all of the sort of insights and learnings from um, those issues come into the perspective and potentially can be applied to MPA management. Um, we also, in, in this project, we see a real reciprocity between Indigenous science and Western science. We think Indigenous science is, is can help kind of fill holes and and, and improve the insights and interpretation of Western science, but that in turn, Western science can actually help um, kind of recover and rebuild some of what has been lost through time um, in indigenous science due to displacement, disconnection, depopulation, and outright theft. Um, and I think this project is timely because um, I think less than a year ago, the White House issued a directive on um, bringing indigenous traditional ecological knowledge more into federal decision making and, and a number of agencies, no included, are now working out implementation plans. So with that background, I'm now going to turn it over um, first to my collaborator, David Whedon, um, with the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe, who's going to offer um, his perspective um, on, on why, uh, why the tribe is involved in this project. So David, take it away. Kui Kwasin, Nutamas, Masipi Wampanoag, Natasawis, Winata, Indene. Hello, everyone. My name is David Whedon. I'm, I serve as the tribe's uh, Mashpee, Wamp the Wamp Mashpee Wampanoag tribe's historic preservation officer, and also I sit as an elected tribal councilman. Um, as such, I'm working with our, our other department, the Natural Resources Department, um, Jason Steiding and Dale Oakley. Um, of which uh, Jason Steiding is the uh, director of that program and uh, Dale uh, Oakley Jr. is the uh, assistant director. So in collaboration with them, we've, we we want to work with Nurikus and on this LendFast program because culturally a little bit about who we are as a people, the Mashpee Wampanoag uh, tribe has been here since time immemorial uh, through our oral histories. Uh, it informs us of being here throughout at least one ice age. Um, Archaeology as a science uh, has, has determined that we've been here since 12, minimally 12,000 years. Um, it's our position that a lot of our ancient uh, archaeological sites and things are actually out in the um, submerged in the ocean bottom as uh, the 
glacial uh, sheets came across uh, our area, we moved and adapted with those uh, climate changes and um, sea level rise. And so at different points uh, throughout our history over the past you know, 10,000 years minimally, um, the landscape has changed greatly to where areas now that are submerged were once exposed and inhabitable. Um, our oral histories speak of times when you could walk out to Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket. Um, and with that uh, comes a lot of our cultural insights, um, our connectedness to the shared environment. We rely on everything we share um, the space with. So in that is culturally our uh, some of these living beings are our relatives, like the whales, uh, the heron. Uh, they're incorporated into our DNA and things of that nature. So there's a moral and cultural obligation to take care of these uh, beings and take care of the shared space, um, not just for ourselves, uh, but for future generations. Uh, that's culturally ingrained through most Indian tribes have that uh, way of thinking. That you know our, our our time here is borrowed time. We do not own land. The whole concept is kind of foreign to us. And so when we walk upon the land and whatever we do upon the land, we tread lightly so that we don't leave lasting in, impacts. Um, so that the future generations share the resources that we now appreciate. And that's a cultural responsibility that we have. Um, it guides and informs our decision making, and we recognize the cohesiveness of uh, every decision that we make and everything that we do impacts something else. And so th these are kind of some of the foundational um, insights that I hope that we bring as a tribe to this project and figure out a better way to work uh, collaboratively, co collaboratively with our, our federal and state and local partners uh, within the region. Um, I'll leave it there and um, hand it back over to Jake to pass along. Well, thanks, David. I'm just going to hand it right off to Paul Puglio, who is the head male speaker of the Kawasuk Band of the Pentecost Abenaki people, and, and who's going to provide his perspective. Thanks, Paul. Kwai Nidobak. Hello, friends. My name is Paul Puglio. I am the head speaker for the Kawasuk Band of the Pentecost Abenaki people, headquartered in Alton, New Hampshire. I have been a tribal leader since the 18, 1980s. However, my working career was as a mechanical engineer within the New England energy industry. Much of my professional work was related to environmental and occasionally indigenous issues. As an engineer, I worked within the digital world of Western science, but I was also very aware of my indigenous knowledge and upbringing. I was raised within a four season fishing family in the 1950s and 1960s, our family spent every spring and summer fishing within the Wampanoag homelands of Paramet and Nauset, now known as the Cape Cod towns of Provincetown, Truro, Wellfleet, and East Ham. Being indigenous, I always had a different world vision and understanding of Nandakina, our homelands, and in particular, the importance of our coastal areas and waterways. The ocean and our, all of our waterways were vital for our human survival because they were an important source of our foods and medicines throughout history. I've witnessed the human process that has degraded these vital resources that are even more threatened today by climate change and ocean level rise. Since 2008, our Kawasaki Band started a partnership with the University of New Hampshire doing various research projects that was uh, led us along a path of convergent studies that combines Western digital science world with our indigenous analog world of knowledge. Our knowledge is based on many generations of observation of our natural world. We have found records from the early 1700s that are, illustrates our specific concerns about colonial dams that stop the flow of our aquatic resources. Our contemporary research work has been dedicated to the study of our oceans and waterways lakes and rivers, but especially our coastal estuaries and landscapes that are so important for all life forms. Today, we remain in the conservation movement with many like-minded partners to remove dams, re improve culvert designs, and in general, restore our rivers, estuaries, and other related wetlands. We have already seen the impacts of rising sea level through our ongoing archeological work. Many of our coastal research areas of interest, in, of interest are disappearing faster than we can get in to do the research and study them. 
these areas of particular interest because we've been able to recover fish bones and other aquatic evidence to give us an indication that the fish species within the Pescadua and greater watershed and the Great Bay were very robust and healthy in the 1600s. Furthermore, the shell middens that once dotted the New England coastline have all but disappeared. But based on our historical research supported by advanced Western science indicates that shellfish harvesting was a critical coastal resource for our food. This is why we stro so strongly support the oyster and eelgrass restoration movement that's ongoing. Projects such as this one are part of our overall commitment related to research protection restoration. As a small tribal community, we do not have the resources technically and financially, but we envision that our partnerships with Western science research combined with our indigenous knowledge, we have great benefit to us all in the future well-being of all of our oceans, waterways, and coastal landscapes. We give great thanks Gisiolani, to Linfest for supporting our efforts. Thanks, Paul. And Vicki, I just have one quick wrap-up slide and, and then we'll be done. Um, so just a few points on how we think this project will ultimately inform management. Um, our, our PIs, our co-PIs um, bring together both leaders from indigenous communities and MPA managers and scientists. So the relevant sort of decision makers are all right at the table. Um, th this may get to the question that Monique put into the chat um, about how we expect the lessons of this project to be applicable elsewhere. I think the immediate answer is we don't know, but we want to answer that question. And I think by uh, structuring this as a collaboration that cuts across indigenous cultures and MPAs, we're going to facilitate knowledge transfer um, and also see what kind of emergent lessons are learned. Um, we have engaged and are keeping informed NOAA leadership on this. Um, we'll be working closely with the friends, stewards, and advisory groups of these MPAs. Um, and ultimately, what we aim to produce from this project is a set of a sort of scientific assessments and that science blending both traditional Western and indigenous perspectives um, based on those recommendations for how management of these MPAs can be changed. But then based on the collective experience, the synthesis that we hope will be um, of use to people elsewhere. And with that, I'll wrap us up and uh, say thank you. Thank you so much. So we are right at time for the Q&A. We have just under 40 minutes. So thank you all so much for presenting your work. This is incredibly exciting. We're gonna open it up to questions. Just make sure you let us know which team you're addressing to make things go smoothly. If it's a general question, you know, we'll, we'll leave it up to that. As a reminder to our grantees, while we did ask you to keep the presenters for two to three people just for time's sake, Anyone in your team is welcome and encouraged to answer the questions. We also encourage you to pop on camera as you answer the questions. So for those of you who we have a good number of people who have already started sending questions into the chat and we will go through those. And as a reminder, if you have general questions about LLP, go ahead and send those to info at linfestocean.org. It is a monitored account and we will definitely get back to you. I will say we did get a question earlier that said, is it possible to apply for new grants for projects? And if so, how? And I did respond, but I will also tell everyone here, we currently do have an open RFP that we are not discussing during this webinar, but if you do wanna learn more about it, I will drop the link to that in the chat. And then everything else will be focused on, on these. The first question for us is to David Wheaton and Jake Kreitzer. Excellent that Indigenous science will be incorporated more into our MPA management. Do you already have a sense of whether, to which extent, the Indigenous science from this region will be replicated in similar sites elsewhere? Yeah, Vicki, and I noticed that Monique followed that up, um, noting she's interested in Paul's perspective on that as well. Oh, I, I, so sorry. I, that's okay. I, I spoke to that at the end of our presentation, so I... I I think I would just turn to Paul or David to see if they want to add anything more. I think we're, we're getting more involved with uh, different types of projects in the maritime environment. Um, we have a lot going on here in the Northeast with offshore wind uh, deployments. Um, our water quality is um, getting to be in critical um, situations uh, in a lot of the historic and culturally associated 
uh, watersheds uh, in and around our coastal and our region here in Cape, our part of the Cape Cod. Um, so there's a lot of concerns and a lot of different efforts that are, are focusing a whole lot of attention um, outside of climate adaptation and just uh, the climate changes that are going on and mitigating those things. So we're hoping to nurture relationships to, to have more of an active role, uh, not just in MPA areas, but within all maritime environments and coastal regions. Fantastic. I'd like to add that uh, we found that uh, we've started doing archaeological work along the coastal areas that are most threatened right now. And we're finding things that we always suspected but never could prove scientifically. But we found that even cod species were, were actually closer to the shore and more robust in size than they are in a contemporary sense. We're finding a lot of uh, nuanced uh, records by digging deep into the archaeological results. We're finding that the fish species that were harvested uh, were being dried and uh, processed along the coastal areas. We're finding this through archaeology, but up until this point, we've always been not so much interested along the coastal area, but now with the rising sea level, we're fast losing these sites, and we've documented how many we're going to lose, and it's a significant number. So we're really concerned that we've got to up our game and do more and more research along the coast to determine exactly uh, what was the benchmark? Uh, what were the what was the parameters back in the 1600s? What did the ocean look like then? And that's what we're, we're trying to stress right now. And how can we restore it back to those levels again? Great. The next question we have is for the projects that will help inform tourism or industry, Bonaire, ETP, do you have plans to engage tourism and fishing industry during this project or afterwards? Any thoughts on how to keep those conversations productive? Karen, I see you're typing. Did you want to say something? Yeah, sure. This will be faster. <laughs> yes, of course. So with our tourism operators, our dive shops, our water sport operators, um, any any management or, or hotels, they're all involved in our in our stakeholder consultation that we do anytime we're looking at rezonation or management, or let's say during an extreme bleaching event, we decide to close sites. We first consult with those uh, stakeholders and we value their input uh, and take that into consideration, of course. And just to add on to that, we've been developing like a sort of mapping interface where we can collect information in a really easy way from like dive operators or fishers about like what areas are most important to them. And then like potentially to talk through scenarios, like if we were gonna temporarily close some dive sites as a way to reduce stress, like which are the sites that would have a really major economic impact to their business and so that we can take those potential um, economic and social costs into consideration when we think about different uh, management responses. Great, and if there's anyone from the ETP group that wants to jump in and answer this as well, feel free. And as you guys are coming up with questions, feel free to just drop them in the Q&A. We'll wait a couple minutes as more come in. I am happy to answer the question for the ETP project. Marviva is going to be engaging the fishing industry within the, the, the workshops. They are partners of the management body of the of the marine corridor, the CMAR, and they are going to be reaching out with the different working groups. Some are more focused on fisheries, other more on conservation, other more on tourism. So the the link and the the work with fishers is going to be through the CIMA management body and the relationship that Marviva has has with them. So building on existing relationships. Sounds good. The next question is, hi, this is to the Baja California MBA team. The community support element of establishing MPAs was really interesting. 
how do you involve the community with your efforts? In Baja California Sur, the efforts seem to be restricted to biological communities and the tourism industry with limited opportunities for locals to become involved with the NGO and support better management of the NPAs in the area. Uh, okay. Am I, am I being heard? Hi, thanks Pamela. I'm not sure if you're hearing me. We can hear you. Yes, we can hear you. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to very briefly talk about it. And I think then Ines will probably jump in. Uh, a lot of the community based reserves, uh, which are actually called fishing reserves, they have been established because the communities decided to establish them. And we have supported them throughout the way on which are, could be the best places and, and, and shapes and types of restriction that they could take. So just want to stress out that it's usually the opposite way around. We support when our partners decide that they want to establish these uh, reserves. And a lot of it sparked from an initial one that was established in Natividad. Now other communities have been seeing the benefits and have contacted the team members to support them in, in similar efforts. And I don't know if Ines maybe can give a bit more perspective from Kobe, who has also been on the ground doing that. Um, not sure, Ines? Not sure if Ines Lopez could talk. Vicky, you might need to unmute her. Um, okay, allow to talk. I've asked you to unmute. There we are. Hey. So sorry. <laughs> That's fine. I just couldn't un unmute myself. Um, yeah, thanks so much for the question. Actually, uh, uh, adding on to uh, what Noor explained, the work that we've been doing with the communities uh, in the Pacific, it's a very uh, long-term work. We've been working with these communities for over almost 20 years now. So um, we basically take a long time on building trust with the communities. We are very present there. We are um, we we try to build conversations at first. I, like I say, the first steps are just like, you know, go get some coffee together and just chat and talk about the needs and the opportunities and the, and the challenges also that they're facing. And with that, what we try to do with the communities is to engage them through participatory workshops and, and different uh, field activities on bringing their best knowledge and, and uh, capacities, bridging, bridging, them, bridging that with the best science available. And so, they are the ones to make the decisions at the very end. So maybe sometimes we can suggest, you know, we think uh, this could be a good tool for you. Do you want to try it? And we just go on and test it together. If it works, then they are the ones to, you know, just push uh, uh, and continue with this management tools that, that we're working with. These communities have been working with this uh, marine reserves for more than 15 years or so. And what we try to do is not um, guide the process, but rather support the process so that they can make the decisions themselves and they have all the opportunities and capacities that they feel that they need uh, uh, for the best outcome uh, for the community. So it's not that we are uh, trying to guide it, but rather support it just like uh, walk hand by hand with, with the community. Sounds good. And then we had someone from the Kreitzer team that had their hand up. So if you have a question, feel free to put it in the Q&A. But if you have a comment, you should be able to unmute now. That works. Um, OK, well, if you have any additional questions, 
We do still have some time on the Q&A. Again, I will give it just a couple minutes to see if anyone wants to add anything. Otherwise, we will get to wrapping up. So please let us know if you have any questions. If not, we will get the recording up on our website and email it out to you shortly. Okay, sounds good. I'm not seeing anything rolling in. Please let me know if there's any last minute questions, but otherwise I will get to wrapping up the, oh. Are we, so there's another question. Are we having more meetings further on to share findings? We will be putting information up on our website, on social media, and throughout our newsletter as these projects progress. There will be opportunities later down the line to have potentially more in-depth webinars as these projects go along, maybe with just one of the projects. So there will definitely be updates throughout, um, throughout the course of the life of these projects. And you will be able to keep up with those online. And if we do do another webinar, we will send it to the same list we sent it to. We will send it to everyone who signed up for this one. So you will definitely see it and you will definitely be kept in the know of what is going on with all of this work. Yeah, and I just wanted to add, because I think this came from Inez, who's part of a project team, um, that we are also thinking of ways to connect the members of the project teams with each other to have more informal conversations as these move forward. Um, so if folks have ideas about that, we're always willing to hear them too. Thanks, everyone. Great. Well, with that, we have no more questions in the Q&A, so I want to thank everyone who presented. Thank you to all the research teams who were here. Like I said, we will keep you informed of the outputs that come out of this work, and we have our other webinar next week talking about the remaining three research projects at 9 a.m. on Thursday. Feel free to register, and we will hopefully see you there. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.